Okay, so here they are. You know, one of the things they tell you is never stand between a sailor and liberty. And I feel like I'm standing between you and some liberty here, some time off, right? So this could be a dangerous place to stand. Um, okay, so. Kind of dovetails into some of the things Mark. that they've been talking about. Can you hear me? No. Nope. Just isn't the top. Still off. Oh, what's that? Oh, come on. Can you? Oh, perfect. Let me do that. This makes me want to sing some karaoke. You guys are gonna regret that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the piece that uh, I wanted to talk about is give you a little context first about what we're doing in the Navy why we're doing it, and then, you know, take some questions from you guys because you may have some. And I, I understand most everybody here is agencies or supporting agencies. Is that correct? Okay. All right. How many people have heard me speak before? Maybe because you may hear some of the same jokes. Yeah, it's like going to my, you know, lunch with my dad at the senior center. You're going to get the same jokes again. I just just laugh anyway. Just hang there with me, okay? Okay, we're going to do a little nerd test here, okay? This is a nerdy crowd. I love nerdy crowds. So if you have more than one computing device, iPad, iPhone, Android, computer, router, gaming console, put your hand in the air, keep it in the air. If you got more than two, three, four, five, six, our nerds are emerging, seven, eight, we're into Lord of the Rings category, nine, 10, 10. Okay, think about that, 10 devices, right? If I had asked that question 10 years ago, five years ago, you'd been the cool kid with the flip phone 10 years ago, right? But now, 10 devices, you know, nobody even bats an eye. You probably got five phones at home that you don't even use anymore because they're old, right? You don't want to get rid of them. You don't know what to do with them, right? What does that mean to us? What does that phone, for example, in your pocket changed about the way you live? It's changed everything, right? Let's talk about the pro problem we're all facing, or the challenge we're all facing, or the opportunity we're all facing, which is exponentially accelerating and converging technology. It's not just that Moore's Law is your grandma's law, okay? It's that it's exponentially accelerating and converging. So what do we mean by that? Let's look at some examples. What about um, combining Uber with an electric car and an autonomous vehicle? What does that change about the way we think about transportation? It changes everything. I mean, kids born today will never learn how to drive a car. They will not own a car. There will be no pet boys, car dealerships, car rental companies, car insurance. When I go to go somewhere, I'll walk out of my house. There'll be something there, a car or a hovercraft or something. It'll scan a chip in my head and charge me two bucks. And based on my heuristics, what I do every day, it's going to take me to the Pentagon. Sadly, that soul-crushing place that it is. It'll take me to the Pentagon. You know, I walked by a guy the other day. It was great. I was like, hey, man, how's it going? He's like, living the dream one nightmare at a time. <laughs> but anyway, um, it, it'll charge me two bucks to take me over to the Pentagon. And if I'm not going to the Pentagon, say I'm just going to go fly somewhere, I'll be like, hey, take me to Reagan instead, and it'll take me to Reagan, and it'll charge me four bucks. But that's the world we're going to live in. And if you think that's far off, because I did see a little squirming, you know, hey, I want to drive a car because I'm the best driver there is. Gosh darn it, right? That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen sooner than you think because of the accelera acceleration, okay? And, you know, a couple years ago, how many of you even heard of Uber? You know, unless you were German, everything was Uber fantastic, right? You didn't even hear Uber. And now, how many of you today Ubered here today or lifted here today or have it on your phone as an app, right? I mean, it is just the way it's happening. And it's not even like people have to tell you, uh, you better use Uber because it's a good thing. No. You know, it's the same thing like with Snapchat or, you know, some of the stuff. My, my, my daughter uses Instagram and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, like I didn't have to tell her. She, I didn't have to go to her and say, hey, you're going to use Snapchat and you're going to like it right? Um, she uses it because she thinks I can't get her pictures. She thinks they disappear. I'm like, hey, honey, mommy worked at NSA. I can get your pictures. Don't worry about it, right? <laughs> Don't kid yourself, okay? <laughs> mom cannot, mom tracks you all the time. I know you are 24-7. Um, so anyway, but my point is, no, all kidding aside, it's changing everything. So what is that doing to the military? What is that doing to the Navy? So let me explain to you a little bit about what our environment, our information environment looks like in the Navy today because it's broken. It's awful. 
We have networks, maybe some of you guys have some similar problems in some of your agencies that are a hodgepodge of a whole bunch of old legacy networks that are kludged together, huge cybersecurity attack surface footprint, lots of things that don't interoperate with each other, very hardware stack based, not cloud based, not agile, um, all those kind of things. And it's just, it creates an environment where you can't get the information that you need to have an operational advantage, to have an operational advantage over an adversary. That's what we want. We want to put a warhead on a forehead the most efficient way we can, right? And that re requires us to have good information all the time. We don't have that environment today. So let me give you an example. You're a potato farmer and you're a sous chef. Okay, what's your context of potatoes? When you're a farmer, what do you think about? Yeah, growing them, selling them, getting them to market, not diseased, manure. You better not be thinking about manure. I'm not eating at your restaurant. Okay, what are you thinking about as a sous chef? Potatoes. Okay, well, like if you're a chef, if you're cooking potatoes, what, you help her out, what would you think about? Cleaning them, cutting them. Fresh. He knows everything. He's, he's going to be my both guy. Yeah. We have, we have recipes, all that kind of stuff, butter, right? Yeah, oh, there you go. I guess the right guy. He's a, he's, he's a carb loader. He likes it, right? Um, but the point is. No, I'm just, hey, I'm a carb loader. You know, I hate the Internet of Things because, like, you know, I'll get an email on Monday morning from my doctor be like, hey, Barrett, lay off the hog and dust. I'm like, how does he know? And then I'm like, refrigerator, dark me out. The refrigerator sent him a note. Um, but anyway, so in that context, you have different contexts of your potatoes, right? You're thinking how you cook them, how you're going to serve them, what people are going to like, recipes, blah, 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 how you cut them. You're thinking of the, the uh, you know, how do you get them to market, what are you going to grow, fertilizer, all that. If I'm on a Navy ship today and I want information about potatoes, I have to, one, ask for it, which is my first problem. That should be a first red warning for you. Second, I get all that crap. And I have to use the old cranial unit here to determine what is it out of that that I need to make some sort of decision. And, you know, I don't know about you, but as the older I get, you know, the old cranial unit only has so much RAM in it. Something goes in, like Britney Spears' new boyfriend's name. Something goes out, like Pythagorean theorem, OSI model. Something I really don't need, right? But the bottom line is, you know, we're expecting humans to do today what machines can already do for us if our transport, the way we move information, and our data are in the right format and the right, the right mechanism to get it there. So when we think about that, we also think about, you know, how um, the way we, uh, we do business just... Uh, uh, we develop applications, like they talked about the DevSecOps environment. One of the big things that we're going to talk about and what the Navy's doing is how we're, we're doing that kind of thing. Used to be a long time ago, you had big monolithic applications. How many of your agencies use those today still? These old legacy, big monolithic applications that are highly integrated, and oh boy, that's a good thing. But then every time you need to change something, it's 18 months of redoing your security accreditation paperwork or redoing the testing or making sure everything doesn't you know, break when you put it out there. Well, we have the same problem. That's a very, uh, that's, a, that's an environment that will not get us any war funding advantage ever. Okay, that's an environment we have to move away from. Think about it in terms of your own life. Years ago, when you wanted to buy a plane ticket, you went on... American's website or United's website or, you know, Delta, and you started building a spreadsheet and you probably had a little notes written on toilet paper or whatever saying, hey, here's how much it costs, and you're making phone calls, right? Now, you go on Kayak or Expedia or Travelocity or whatever, and one, it probably already knows your preferences. Thank you, Facebook and Big Data and everybody else out there, right? But it probably already knows your preferences. It knows that, you know, you want to sit in an aisle seat and, you know, you want a kosher meal and you don't want to sit in next to any Lord of the Rings fans, right? Okay, so you get on the plane, and there you are enjoying your rom-com and having a kosher meal, and three, hour, three rows back, someone's getting their ear chewed off about how hard it is to get out of Middle Earth this time of year, but it's not you, right? So that's how the technology is helping you. You know, you don't have to go to all those different sites anymore. Someone is doing that back end, what, how to get the information you need to you, right person, right time, right information, very cliche, but this is what, the, in, what can do for us, right? So when I got into this job, I said, okay, this is the hill I want to die on because I've lived with this mess in the fleet forever. What I want in the fleet is this. When you go through the Straits of Hormuz, that's a real dodgy transit. So the aircraft carrier will go through, and it's, uh, you're always worried about Iran, what Iran's going to be doing. Um, you're worried about um, just fishing. I mean, a whole bunch of things. It's very high 
uh, high tense moments. You have your shotgun, which is a cruiser or destroyer next to you who actually has some weapons that can shoot because the carrier, surprisingly, can't really shoot anything. They got a lot of planes, but they're kind of like, you know, shooting BB guns when everybody else can shoot, you know. <laughs> bigger things. So you have your shotguns. A couple ships will go through at the same time, and it's a very scary transit. And very Everybody's on high alert. One piece of information that everybody needs going through that is course and speed. How fast are you going and what direction are you going? So that one piece of data, I want one authoritative piece of data shared by many in the context they need it, potato, potato, right? So what I want is the chief engineer who would have that piece of data combined with what's the status of the plant readiness to know, can the ship support that course and speed? The navigator needs to know, hey, at that course and speed, am I gonna run into anything? Is there shoal waters? Is there any hazards to navigation? The communications officer, which I was a, been a communications officer for 29 years now, needs to know, am I gonna drive out of my satellite footprint, right? Because, you know, being a commo means never having to say you're welcome. That's a, that's a bad day for a commo, driving out your satellite footprint, right? Um, the intel, uh, the battle watch captain or the tactical action officer um, would need to know that information. So that, combined with the latest intel, um, tells me that, hey, the last time a carrier went through the Straits of Hormuz, within about 20 nautical miles, Iranian UAVs started harassing the ship. Beef up your, your shotgun on, the, on your starboard side. So... Again, you want this information to be predictive. That's the environment we want. That's the environment we want to build. And so what we did is, I don't know if I got one slide up there. Uh-oh, they gave me the clicker. This could, be, this could be a problem. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. He's helping me because I clicked myself out of my own slide. There you go. Um, so what we're trying to do is build an environment that allows us to be agile, similar to what they were talking about a few minutes ago. So this, this slide, this is an awful slide, I know. I, I'm like Coco the monkey when it comes to making slides, and I try to get someone else to make a better one. I just can't do it yet, you know. You think you have all this power as an animal. You have no power. You're getting coffee and donuts for somebody, right? But I can't even get a good slide made. The bottom line is what we're trying to do is look at the architecture from end to end. You can't just take pieces of this and try to fix it, which is what's happened in the Navy over the years because this is a hard, hairy problem, right? This is fixing end-to-end -end transport and fixing data, right? Those two things. You cannot fix data without consideration of your transport, particularly in the business like we're in. Because if you look at that little thing floating at the top there, that's a satellite, okay? For the Navy, we are dependent. It is an Achilles heel for us. We are dependent upon what we call reach back, reach back for information. And right now, we do that really inefficiently on a ship. Lots of transactional back, lots of the business logic, and the transactions are happening ashore, so you got to do all this stuff over that little satellite link, right? You're not getting the kind of bandwidth that you would get here at home. And so how do you make most efficient use of the bandwidth you have? And oh, by the way, you're going to lose that. At some point, you're not going to have it, and you're not going to have any of it probably. And that may be for longer than you expect. And that's a hard lesson to teach people in the Navy because operational commanders don't like to hear that. Right? They like to think they'll have a little bit. Or I said, no, you got to plan to have nothing. And what are you going to do? So let's look at an architecture where we can massively pump as much as possible forward so when you do lose that link, and you'll lose it because, you know, Seaman Timmy's got his tongue stuck in the crypto, or, you know, you actually want to reduce your footprint. You don't want everybody to know you're out there so you're not radiating out. Or maybe there's a casualty on your equipment. There could be a thousand reasons you lose it, but you're going to lose it for something. A adversaries taking it out. Um, so what you want to do is pump as much information as you can forward to the edge where the people are going to use it. Put the AI forward at the edge where the information could quickly be reused and learn based on heuristics and present information to the watch officer, to the Chang, to the navigator, in the context they need it, potatoes, potatoes, right? So we said, okay, to do that, you really need to look at four key pillars. Um, did I get a time check? I don't want to blabber on too long. How long am I? Does anybody know how many minutes I got left? Okay, all right, 10 minutes, okay, all right. Okay, so the four key pillars are, we said, you got to have data standardization first. Now, this one is a hard one for me because um, I get incredible resistance. You know, what we have in the native, native right now is what I call uh, data jackassery, right? We've not had standardization. We've let everybody do whatever the heck they want. We're like, oh, everybody just build APIs to everything. We'll figure out how to work it out. Okay, I'm not a big fan of APIs. I know they're easy and developers love them. And if you're sure, that's great. But APIs also increase your attack surface. And every time you change something, you got to go back and change the API. It's, it, I'd rather standardize as much as possible at the data element layer. So we've picked extensible markup language. XML is our data standard for a couple reasons. Understand there's other standards out there in the industry. This is a big one that industry uses. Good for interoperability. A little heavier protocol because of the tagging. 
but it does a couple things for us that we need in the Navy. We need better security on the data element layer to allow us to do things like zero trust, right, in the future, have more of a zero trust uh, as opposed to just defense in depth. Why does that matter? So I'll tell you. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Stanislav Petrikov, and I'm probably butchering his name, but he was the guy who uh, prevented World War III, Russian Lieutenant Colonel, does anybody know that guy's story? He just died last year, actually. He was sitting in a missile silo in, you know, Joe's Bekistan, you know, Siberia somewhere, and he got on his Geeksevsky screen, you know, the little screen that tells you what you're going on. He saw incoming ICBM, followed immediately by five more. Now, his training, his TTP, everything that had been drilled into him for years and years and years, getting him all the way up to lieutenant colonel, was that they launch, you launch. You know, nobody's dipping their toe in the nuclear you know, weapon world. Hey, let's just launch one, see how that goes, see what the Russians do. Nobody's doing that. It was mutually assured destruction. That was our policy, right? So he saw that, and he was like, four molar suck in a big way. That is not what we expect to happen. That is very, that's an anomaly. That is, there's something wrong. But he knew he had 28 minutes to figure out if that was wrong, or it could have been a really bad decision. And he waited 28 minutes, and no boom. Think about the, the, the pucker factor in that watch room for 28 oh. minutes. Now think about the call to the boss later. Yeah, hey boss, I just want to let you know what's going on in watch today. Yeah, the vending machine ran out of coke. We had a little nuclear uh, launch issue, and there was something with the truck in the back. He was like, go back to that second thing. What, what was that you just said? But my point is, he was smart enough to know something's not right. If I'm looking at a screen today on a Navy ship, unless it's wildly off, and a ship track is showing me it's sitting in the middle of Dubai somewhere, I don't question it. So a sophisticated adversary is not going to come in loud and proud and exfil a whole bunch of data and change a whole bunch of data really obviously. They're going to operate right at your water line, and they're going to change something to make you make a bad decision, to change your warfighting calculus in a way that gives them an advantage. We can't have that. So again, go back to XML. It allows me to tag data at the lowest layer using SAML, a protocol associated with XML and some other things, encryption. It allows me also to do compression. One of the things you get with this data format is EXI, which is an compression algorithm. It allows you to compress up to 40 to 60%. That allows me to use that pipe smarter, right? Um, it also allows me to use what are called cross-domain devices. And you may use some of these in some of your agencies, but it allows you to move data from an unclassified network to a classified network and back. NSA's approved cross-domain devices use XML. So there's multiple reasons why we're interested in this. It also will allow me to do quality of service. Right now, if I'm on a ship, if I want unclassified data or classified data, I get all unclassified without any kind of prioritization of what's important or all classified without prioritization. That's kind of how we do it by pipes. What I want to be able to do if I'm the CEO of the ship is say I'm on a humanitarian assistance disaster relief effort and I want my information about MREs and water before I want my public affairs information, before I want my, you know, Seaman Timmy's letter to grandma, right? I want to be able to be the, as the CEO of the ship, prioritize that and get what I need first and fastest so I can make operational choices that are smart. So again, that's the data pillar. The second pillar is use of shared infrastructure. So right now we have people who come on the ship and they drop boxes. We're telling them, Drop code, not boxes. We don't want your boxes. We want you to use the shared infrastructure. Now, that shared infrastructure is going to have to be beefed up. It's going to have to be like a petaflop server, right? It's going to be huge. It's going to be a data center, a tactical cloud afloat. Um, and we don't want people bringing the boxes in, which increase attack surface, more work for Seam and Timmy. It's just, it's just a nightmare, right? Um, also, if you use that shared infrastructure, one of the things that we've done is we've automated some of the processes so that we can streamline by going to this environment where we break down applications. So where we used to have these monolithic applications like we talked about, uh, the kayak example, right? We're taking these big monolithic applications and making microservices out of them, like they were talking about a little bit earlier. So everybody's gonna have to decompose their applications into microservices. They're gonna have to expose their data and expose it in XML back into the cloud even so that people can reuse it for things they never intended to use it for to begin with. So as we go to the shared infrastructure, though, it allows us to, in this DevSecOps environment, including the SEC, from start to finish, we're tightening up how we do those applications. It's no longer free-for-all. It's no longer data jackassery. You've got to follow some standards, which is, of course, the hard part about this. It's institutional resistance and inertia from people. Technology is not the hard part here, as you guys know. It's people. This is technology change management. So you have to show them what some of the benefits are. It's called pet the cat, right? You're going to be okay. 
you're going to be fine. Just hang in there with me, right? So you got to show them the benefits of this. Some of the benefit of this is when we started this, so we tested this architecture. I got a team together last year, and I told them, okay, I want to test on the ship in six months. And their heads, like, almost exploded because you know how things take forever in the military, right? They're like, oh, God, that's a long haul. Now, luckily, we had some pieces already working that we could leverage, but I said, nope, six months. So they made it in eight, which was her, 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 her le Herculean effort, right, on their part. Um, and we did test it on Stockdale, Essex, Carl Vinson, and the Blue, Blue Ridge, a couple ships. And what we did is we just tested the ability to develop the software in this more con controlled manner and deliver it to a ship from the time they hit compile through all the testing and security testing, out delivered to the ship and loaded on the ship within 24 hours. So that's why it's called compile to combat in 24 hours. So, and it didn't kind of matter what the application was. We picked a couple different ones, a command and control one, a business app or whatever. It was more important to figure out you know, how do we do it so that the process is repeatable regardless of what the application or software is. Okay, and so one of the things I told the team to first work on was RMF. Does anybody do anything with risk management framework and getting things accredited to go on the net? How fun is that? Don't you love it? Yeah, it's great. I know. It's like you're, when you're a kid and you're sitting home like, I want to be a baseball player, I want to be an astronaut, and I want to do RMF paperwork. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, um, so what we did on RMF is I told them, I said, look, I want this process fully automated in the way we're doing it now, not the old way, executable within 24 hours without a human in the loop. So you're going to inherit the goodness of the, the shared infrastructure. Someone's going to do the heavy lifting on your shared infrastructure. Then you inherit that. You inherit the container, which we've accredited. And all you have to do is accredit your piece of code. So I said, come back to me and show me how you're going to do that within 24 hours. So they came back like a month later. And they were like, hey, ma'am, great news. We got it from 18 months to 12 months. I'm like, hey, wrong denominator. Go back 24 hours. You know? So God bless them. You know what they say in the South, like when you kind of jack something up, they're like, bless their hearts, right? Bless their hearts. They're trying. So I said, bless your heart. Go back. Come see me in two months, you know. And they came back, and they did it. I, I said, you guys need to start with white sheet of paper. You're starting every process associated with how we do this. You need to question every process. And that's what we did. We started tearing down processes that cost the government millions of dollars and hours and hours, hundreds of hours. Because... They have to start with a clean slate and say, okay, what are the minimum security controls, which is the objective of RMF, to give us the risk decision that we need to make this work? And there was another process we had, which was called ship main, but it allows you to put stuff on the ship. And over the years, every time you'd put something on the ship and it would break, they'd have another step to the process, another step. So pretty soon you're like a Sherpa with a pack mule on your back because you got like all these processes you're trying to carry around with you, right? So even they went back. I said 24 hours fully automated. If your objective is to not break, this actually is a better way to do it because you're fielding smaller snippets of code, more controlled, and it's just like your iPhone. You know, you get something that doesn't work right, you just roll back to your previous version, Right? You don't have to wait to go back into the yards and pull equipment off the ship and retest it, highly integrated with everything else. So we did that. It worked fine. And so then we said the last piece of this is the use of the commercial cloud. And why this is so important, I know you just had a whole discussion on commercial cloud, but our policy in the Navy is cloud first for a number of reasons. One is cybersecurity. Two is the analytics and machine learning that we think we'll be able to get at scale and speed that we cannot ever keep up with in DOD. I mean, we will be able to put some stuff on DISA's mill cloud. We will be able to do some of those things. And there may be some things that we keep in a mill cloud because they may be a little sensitive. Uh, NC3, uh, nuclear command and control data, maybe ballistic missile defense. There's a couple missions we may say, yeah, I'm not ready to put it there yet. Um, but you got play people like CIA putting everything out there, right? So we're looking to see how you guys and the other agencies are getting lessons learned too. One of the things that um, from a cybersecurity perspective on the cloud that I've uh, proceed us with caution on is what we call command and control in the cloud. So for example, they have not been offering cloud services for like 40 years. This is fairly new, right? So some of the lessons learned that we're seeing are based on uh, a lot of times it's the application riding on the infrastructure. It's not the infrastructure that's the problem, right? But what is the command and control? What is your ability to control where your information is, how it's being processed, and how they respond when there's an incident? So, for example, we wrote a document, it's about 38 pages long, of specific cloud contracting language that allows us to see to our operational commander, which is Fleet Cybercom, to see to that information in the cloud. And we're not going to have 10 or 15 clouds because that's untenable from a how do you manage it perspective, right? Um, and so, so if, say, you end up with three or four main cloud providers for the Navy, which may extend to that shared infrastructure, I may actually use that that company to provide that infrastructure that I currently do as the government, 
right? But the C2 of the cloud, let me just give you a couple examples of things that we put in there that commercial industry may not be as interested in, but you may be. Um, one is um, uh, a hunt. So for example, I may want to hunt an adversary and not lose valuable intelligence when there's an incident because I may see something else going on somewhere else and I need that information to respond to that. What's gonna happen, what was originally in the cloud contracting language from the vendors and stuff was, hey, when there's an incident, we'll start incident response right away and blah, blah, blah. We're like, time out. No, what I need you to do is, and we put the language, call the battle watch captain at Fleet Cybercom. They will have three hours to decide whether you will start immediately incident response on our data or you will allow them to hunt. Okay, that's a different paradigm. Another thing is logging. You know, they have a thing where they're like, well, you can get to logs anytime you want, 24 seven. We have a server, you can get any logs you want. Yeah, okay, so what if I need to cut chalks with you because I have to triage and I don't know where the problem is and I need to sever that connection? How am I gonna get my logs? Oh, what if you don't keep the logs as long as I thought you did? What if you don't keep the logs in the way I thought you did? So what we did is we said, okay, there's probably about 10 logs that our, our CPTs, our teams, our National Mission Force teams would need to fight tonight if they were gonna do something. We're gonna take that logging of those 10 things or whatever put it off-prem 24-7 in a logging you know, a facility, in one of our facilities on our-prem, where we can just have it all the time. So if something goes wrong, something goes south, we don't have lawyers arguing at the worst possible time when we have an incident and someone's eating our lunch. So you just need to think through those things, like you know, who's controlling your information? Are they U.S. persons, which is what they use as their example. It's not U.S. citizens, U.S. persons. Is that okay with you? you know, is your cloud vendor now buying services from somebody who just got sold to Russia or China? the third party, sub party, sub party. You need to pull those strings all the way through from a cybersecurity perspective. So while we're putting everything in the cloud, while we see the benefits of the cloud, while we're doing our whole DevSecOps in the cloud, and we do think that's the way to go in the future, we're also proceeding with caution, because again, there's gonna be some lessons learned, we're gonna probably learn in the hard way, um, but hopefully between all of us, we can share those and you know, uh, make it better so that people are starting at a higher level every time they do that. So I will stop right now, um, and I'll take any questions you may have. Oh, okay. I was just thinking there is going to be a backlash, and we've already, um, hi, about the backlash, we've already seen there have been some surveys of kids uh, who were 18, 19. They want more live presentations, they're getting tired of going online to learn. So I see some enclaves of resistors to some of this brave new data world, and I wonder how you see this. Yeah, so I think I see a couple things. Um, it's interesting, if you watch what's happening with the NFL, they're losing lots and lots of money because kids are not going to football games, and baseball too, actually, like their parents used to, right? Well, that could be a, a variety of reasons. Some of it is attributable to they, they expect a different environment, right? It's almost like a hybrid environment of multimedia and in-person, right? Um, but what you see a lot too is people, as, a, as, as augmented reality becomes much more sophisticated, where you're gonna be able to smell a gram it and everything. You know, you hear these dystopian kind of things from Ray Kurzweil and some of the futurists where they're like, yeah, you won't ever have to leave your couch. I mean, you'll be able to experience a whitewater raft trip and you never leave to go there. You'll get wet, you'll, you know, fall in the water, you'll feel like you're drowning, you know. And I do believe it will get to the point where augmented reality um, is almost indistinguishable from reality. but there were humans too, you know what I mean? And there's gonna be flaws in that, there's gonna be things that are different. I, I think that the challenge is gonna be for the government is when it comes to things like ethics. So for example, um, let's talk about Tesla, right? Tesla cars are way safer than humans are. You know, when every time there's a Tesla crash, everybody's like, oh my God, look at, you know, it's, it's driving people over, we're letting it kill people, right? Yeah, well, how many other accidents happened that same day that humans were the cause of probably 250 times the amount that killed people as opposed to a machine making a miscalculation? Now, as machines get more sophisticated and they factor in nuance, the ethical decisions, moral decisions, you know, the car coming up to the intersection, do I plow into a tree, let it decide to plow into a tree or hit the baby in the middle? Or China, you see what China's doing with all the data they're collecting on people? Um, social data, they're gonna make decisions about your life, what you can and can't be eligible to do based on the heuristics of what you've done and what they think that big data is gonna do. So think about that, you know, now the car's saying, okay, here's two people crossing the road, the old lady and the, the baby in the buggy. The baby in the buggy's got some disease, but the old lady has, you know, uh, she's actually got a worse disease and she's actually terminal cancer. I'm gonna have the car take her out. 
You know, I mean, there's all these calculuses that are we going to allow machines to make those decisions? Now, think about that in terms of war fighting. We have systems now that will allow us to automatically shoot. Um, you know, our, our, some of our Aegis weapon systems have had that since the USS Stark, but we always still have a human making the push the button decision. Here's where it becomes hard. If I'm still requiring a human to make a decision that actually a machine may be able to make better with all the data they can get than I can as a human, and I still require a human to do it, but my adversaries don't, I see the tactical advantage of speed where they may be able to get me before I get them. Now, part of the problem of that is that AI um, could be corrupted. If I'm a smart cyber guy, I'm gonna go after somebody's AI. Right? I'm not going to try to blow, I'm building a $13 billion aircraft carrier. I'm going to go after and change their AI algorithm just a little bit to make them make a bad decision or change their data. Right? So you have to ask yourself, okay, it's kind of like where your AI went to school. Right? We talk about that. I mean, you think about it. Um, if you think about, there was an example I read which was really great, illustrative. Um, they were translating, basic translation from English to Turkish. And apparently in Turkish, the pronoun for male and female is the same. So they transferred, Joe is a nurse into English and then back into Turkish. And when it went back, or it went into Turkish and then back into English, when it came back into English, it said Josephine is a nurse. Because there's no way Joe could be a nurse unless you're on Meet the Parents. That's crazy talk, right? <laughs> I mean, so there's a gender bias in the guy who's writing the algorithm. So that will get better and better with machine learning and, and in time. You know, 15 years ago, AI was snake oil. It's not snake oil today, right? Even rudimentary machine learning drives business, drives everything. So as we look at what opportunities are there, we also have to look at the threats, but how we can use them. And we don't want to take the first punch. You know, we're not in a defensive mode here. How can I use all these same technologies to go after my adversary and take them down before they can do anything? You know? So I think that the world is going to change. And, and I tell people all the time, if you're not comfortable with changing, you get out of the Navy. Exponentially accelerating technology. How can I leverage it for a tactical warfighting advantage? You have to think that way. For, for us, in the way we live, everything has changed with your cell phone. It's changed everything about the way you do stuff. Think about it. Yeah, it's, it, it's not just the Navy. It's, it's exactly. Yeah. And then we always have to have our eye on what's next. Like another thing I'm pushing is Li-Fi, light fidelity. It's the ability to get Wi-Fi essentially using the light spectrum, your overhead LED lighting. Well, I want that on a ship because I don't want any RF footprint at all. So if I can put, we, and they use it in street lights in Dubai now and in, in buildings in uh, BMW plants in Germany. So if I can use that portion of the spectrum that gives me better cybersecurity, better data rates, other things like that, you know, why wouldn't I try to grab that and find a military advantage to that? So you constantly have to be looking at, for your own agencies, where is there a business or tactical advantage for me to grasping that technology and maybe being that early adapter? Okay, that's it, I think. Okay, let me just take one more real quick, and then we'll call, okay, we'll call it a day. And you guys can leave if you're bored, and that's fine. I, don't, I won't take offense. I get people walking out of my meetings all day long at work. Uh, so I have a question. Congress, if you talk to the folks at CRS or folks, they say it's designed to be inert. inert. I mean, it's not supposed to have a whole lot of changes come through, and unless it's an overwhelming need to have something, they make something happen. If they're the leaders of our government and they're the ones who are pushing this, how do you go about implementing change like you're talking about when the system by design and the leadership that we have is resisting it? Yeah, so here's what's going to happen. If we self-limit based on the bureaucracies we've created, we're going to fail as a nation. Okay, we're already seeing, for example, China putting obscene amounts of money in AI, making themselves the AI center of the world, and not just the coding, but building the infrastructure, OC pipes, uh, quantum physics, uh, quantum computing, all that kind of infrastructure in place to make that a reality. What is that going to do for them? Okay, it's going to give them a military advantage, but it's going to give them an economic advantage that's going to kick our butt. And, and, you know, if you wait too long, you're not going to be able to catch up. You will never catch up exponentially accelerating technology. You better be right there running in front. Okay, so the messages back to Congress need to be, you know, we don't want to end up like the British Maritime, you know, in the 1900s, right? quickly became obsolete. Not that they're obsolete, but you know what I'm saying. They weren't the superpower anymore because they couldn't see what was going to happen next. You know? Yeah. You can look at a whole bunch of companies. Look at Sears and JCPenney's. Right? I mean, look at the companies that were at the forefront of what they did and they weren't able to see, weren't able to be Bezos, weren't able to say, I'm going to deliver your package in an hour. 
You, know, you have to be bold and audacious that way. Our nation needs to be bold and audacious that way and see it as a national imperative, not just a military imperative, not just economic, but for our nation to be out in front. You know what I mean? Um, and, and again, that's a hard message for Congress because we work in these old systems. But let me tell you, um, our adversaries don't work on a POM cycle. You know, when I want new capability out to the fleet, I have to get a requirement written, I have to get it validated, I have to put it in what we call a POM cycle, a budgeting cycle, where you figure out how it's going to get paid. That I'm putting in POM inputs now for 2021 for technology that will be obsolete by the time I buy it. When I finally field it to the ship, because it takes seven, seven to ten years to get everything out to every ship because of operational schedules and stuff, are you kidding me? You know, our government needs to do better. And like we did with this, break down every process. You know, tell your congressman, you know, don't do it that way. We have to assume some risk. You assume risk as an early adopter of technology. You do. But you assume a greater risk of inertia and being scared. Don't be scared.